Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong opposition to H.J. Res 68. For the next several hours on the House floor, we will not be discussing how to raise wages for the middle class, debating how to create a regulatory framework for next generation artificial intelligence technology, or strategizing about competing with China in the 21st century. Instead, we will be debating a handful of resolutions that will provide immediate sanctions relief for human rights violators, illicit arm dealers, and terrorists with American blood on their hands. Now, I'm not being hyperbolic, and I'm not exaggerating. The resolutions before us terminate emergencies that were declared for the express purpose of sanctioning war criminals. Given that we have several similar resolutions on the floor, it is worth providing some background on how the sanctions process worked. In 1976, Congress passed the National Emergencies Act. This act formalized how the president can declare a normal emergency, enumerated certain powers the president can use during such an emergency, and gave Congress the ability to terminate an emergency by a resolution like the one we have before us today. A year later, Congress built on this framework with the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, often referred to as IEPA, which further elucidated what actions the president may take to regulate international commerce in such an emergency. IEPA is the foundation of the modern American sanctions regime. The benefits of IEPA are very clear. They allow the president to move quickly to impose sanctions. Though, of course, some time is needed to jump through appropriate and necessary due process hurdles, the president is able to impose sanctions without a particular congressional mandate. It is my view, likely shared by the sponsor and hopefully many members of this body, that the power over sanctions has moved too much to the executive branch and too far from Congress. Too often, congressionally mandated sanctions are slow rolled or minimized while the executive presses on with its preferred targets. But I do not want to diminish the seriousness and the impressive work professionals at the State Department, the Treasury Department, and the National Security Council do on sanctions. They take the work very seriously and apply thoughtful policies with an intentional detail, executing their actions in a careful manner. Members of Congress should not bitterly substitute their judgment about existing national emergencies without conducting a thorough review of the evidence, obtaining extensive briefings from the executive branch, and gaining a firm understanding of the consequences of a termination. Moreover, each national emergency is reviewed at least annually. The Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration all renewed the national emergency this resolution seeks to terminate. Many national emergencies have been terminated. For instance, President George H.W. Bush terminated the South Africa program after apartheid ended. President Biden terminated the Burundi program not less than two years ago. Let's just take a quick look at some of the individuals currently sanctioned under the DRC Congo program. One is Victor Bout, who for decades Bout flooded the DRC with illegal weapons. He has bragged about his many contacts in financial institutions who helped him evade sanctions, and Bout likely has significant assets that can easily be unfrozen. If this body votes to terminate the executive order that imposes sanctions on Bout, he stands to gain a windfall 
of cash within mere minutes. The DRC program currently places sanctions on ISIS Congo. That's right, the foreign terrorist organization ISIS. And if the Congress votes to pass this, this resolution, ISIS could set up a brokerage account, trade stocks, transfer funds, or keep money in a checking account in the United States of America. So Mr. Speaker, in my humble opinion, ISIS Congo should not be permitted to do any of the above. Neither should the numerous war criminals currently covered under the Congo emergency. I strongly oppose H.J. Res 68, and I implore all of my colleagues to do the same. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman.